Uh, as I said, I'm, uh, my name is Vadim, and I work, uh, I'm a front-end developer at MetaMarkets. Uh, my background involves a lot of D3, and pretty much most of what I do is just write visualizations. Um, I take it sort of for granted that visualizations are for the web. Uh, so when people say like web-based visualizations, I'm like, are there other kinds? Um, and I want to talk to you about something that I'm, re I'm really passionate about. And specifically that data making visualizations is really, really hard. Like, come on. Uh, Sort of unreasonably so, and, and in, in ways you wouldn't really expect, at least when you're starting out with uh, looking into data visualization. Uh, typically, like when you're studying data visualization in like a university course, or just playing around with D3, or looking at the examples, like you have like a small chunk of data provided to you in like a file, uh, and sometimes that's actually all you want. Like not every visualization has to go over a huge data set. That's fine. Um, that's pretty easy. And D3 is a great toolkit, by the way. If you, if you haven't checked it out yet, I'm, I'm sure by the end of like, this day you'll be convinced that, that you have to. Um, D3 uh, basically allows you to like, map data onto, onto the screen uh, in, in SVG, uh, share it with, with your grandma using the web. It's beautiful. The problem is getting this data. And the specific problem is that sometimes like a person would come up to me and be like, hey, we want to make this visualization. How long would it take you? And I think, well, let's see. Uh, like an hour and a half to code uh, the D3 app. Like give me two Red Bulls and I'll do it in an hour and 25 minutes. Uh, and then they're like, great. And an hour and 30 minutes later, I have the visualization up. And they're like, cool, well, it needs to be driven by this data set. I mean, like, come on, <laughs> we're not just I'm not just going to show these visualizations to customers. That's boring. I mean, customers, uh, they give us data all the time. The data lives in a database. Uh, you know, the database is hard to get to or whatever. Uh, and the reality comes to the fact that uh, most databases, at least the ones that I encounter, uh, and that includes like a SQL database, they're not specifically designed to drive visualizations. Databases are designed to show uh, to be able to answer specific queries about the data in an efficient way that allows them to you know, scan over these huge amounts of data efficiently, they're not necessarily going to give you like, the data in the format that you need or in whatever, uh, or maybe you have to take more than one query. So usually, my, in my experience, uh, I designed the visualization, well, or at least somebody with me designs the visualization, I implement it in D3, or a, a similar toolkit, and then, oh, damn. Now I have to go to the database, I have to figure out like, how do I extract this data? Wait, do I like, do I group, do I group by this? Or, okay, and then I need the revenue here. All right, well, it's really boring, and it's probably like uh, the part of uh, my job that is just like, okay, like I just wanna, you know what, let, let's the, let, let the interns do it. I'm gonna go write a new visualization. Um, and even when I extract, extract the data, I still need to transform it. Like usually it comes out in a different shape than what the visualization needs because like if your visualization has like, let's say like it's nested in some way, you have to have the data nested in the same way and you have tools that transform the data for you. Uh, and here's a specific example of the problem, right? This is, this is like a really basic way to get some insight into your data. Uh, it's called a pivot table, I think, in Excel. Uh, it's basically for my, like, for my top four countries uh, by revenue, uh, what are the top three venues that are like, making me money? Well, like, you can't answer this data. I mean, you can't answer this data. Uh, uh, sorry, you, can't, you can answer this question with one query if you're cheating and you have like, a small, tiny data set, because you can like, do two group buys. But on a, on a large data set, this won't work. In fact, uh, I, I didn't want to like, look, look stupid when I come up here, but so I like, query the whole bunch of people who I consider database experts. Uh, you cannot answer this in one single SQL call uh, for any general data set, especially and as, as your data set becomes big, it becomes not general. Um, so this is annoying. Like, this will actually take so long to implement. Like, rendering the table will take you like half an hour 
if you're just starting with D3, or if you're Mike Bostock, he'll actually do it in like three minutes, and you'll be like, whoa. Um, so this is, this is like what I'm talking about. Like implementing this would make me like want to chew my arm off because actually trying to implement these queries, I'll have to actually wait for the database to come back. What if one of the queries is like times out and I, and I end up dealing with like system level stuff here. Uh, I think I shouldn't be dealing with that. Um, and the insight I'm trying to like, the, the thing that sort of sparked this whole inspiration is that Data visualization and querying for data aren't like just two arbitrary things that I happen to be doing at work. Uh, they're actually like I'm trying to it's, I'm trying to query data to solve a problem uh, and to visualize that data in some way. And whatever way I visualize this data, this will determine how I query this data. Like if I'm if I'm visualizing for like I don't know the number of edits on Wikipedia, I'm not going to be querying for I, I don't know like the number of moles in Spain. Like those are, they're obviously connected. And it's crazy that uh, in fact, D3 and like SQL are so disconnected in a sense because I have to write both of them. That really slows me down. So this was, this was a problem I, I, I had in the back of my mind. I was like, how, how the hell does, like how the hell does this work? Is this gonna be like this forever? Um, until I had like a moment of clarity. And that moment came when I read uh, in preparation for speaking to uh, Hadley Wickham, who's a great contributor to R. Uh, I read some of his papers and I came across uh, the paper that where he introduced Ply R, which is like a data transformation tool for R, which is like, I'm t I'm, I'm, I don't use R, but I told it's like the jQuery for, for R. Uh, and uh, this, the paper is linked at the bottom. The, the paper introduced this sort of mental framework called split, apply, combine. That's by no means new. Like this is not, this is not groundbreaking things. In fact, it's everywhere. And the important thing is to recognize that it's everywhere and then to see that everything is like similar because it falls under this pattern. And throughout this talk, I, I, I wanna try to demonstrate to you that this is a, a valuable thing uh, and Please, I'm gonna keep calling it split, apply, combine, but, but please don't like get, you don't have to call it by the same name, you can call it by whatever you want. Uh, but just recognize that it's everywhere and we can do really cool things if we acknowledge that. Uh, what, is, what is split, apply, combine? Just let's, let's take a step back. Uh, it's a way to s express questions about data. So your data, if you think about it, is just a big bag of, of datums, uh, events, or whatever you have. Uh, and like on its own, like, well, whatever, it's kind of meaningless. Uh, the only way to make sense of it is to uh, split it by some, by some function, uh, or in, in, like just look at its country attribute, and there you'll get several buckets. Each bucket will have the data with that attribute. Um, then for each of those buckets, you can apply some function. You can be like, all right, let's scan through all of this bucket, uh, let's look at all the revenues and let's sum them up. And this is again, like, I'm not saying anything new here. Like, you, whatever data query language is your favorite, you're already probably seeing like the, like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really selling anything here. Like, this is pretty, pretty common. Uh, after, after you labeled all your buckets with your, like the country and then like the sum revenue, you can sort them in some way. And in fact, uh, you, like in this case, I sort them by the sum of the revenue and I limit it to four just to get the top four. And this is the top four of revenues in my made up data set. Uh, and that's great. Uh, like this is actual data I can, I can use. And you can, you, you can do this pretty much in every, uh, in every language. If you notice, um, in pandas, Chang sh showed like there was just a line of code that was like, uh, sorry, split is, is commonly called group by. Uh, I think like grouping or splitting is like funny. It's like the same but like totally different. Uh, but actually, it, it means the same thing because uh, you could say instead of splitting this data right here, I'm grouping these guys together. So it's a notion of semantics here. But uh, he, he had a line of code that was like group by something, sum something, sort something. If 
you, if you only added a limit, it would actually be this query. Um, the, the, the cool thing about split apply combine uh, is that uh, you can nest it. I mean, th there's nothing limiting you to doing something just once. If you, if you have a, a useful operation, sometimes it's very useful to perform it several times over. Uh, and in this case, for example, I can take this big chunk of data and I can split it up into countries. So I just have buckets of countries like before. On those buckets, I can compute whatever I want, but I still have those like, nice little buckets of data. I can keep splitting them. Now, mind you, this is, this is just theoretical thought, right? This is just a way to think about this in your head. Uh, you don't have to implement a database that literally does this, but a lot of databases internally do something similar. In any case, you can take these buckets and you can split them further, in this case by venue. And then uh, you can group within each of these buckets, so you can not group, you can uh, sort within each of these buckets and then limit to something, and together, like this operation actually answers that like unanswerable question uh, that I posed at the start. Uh, technically, with like if if somehow you could express this as one query where you have like split by this, split by country, split by venue, uh, then this query would would answer uh, that question. And that's a that's a really powerful insight because. Uh, in visualization, we kind of do something similar. Uh, but before that, uh, as I, sa I keep saying, like, this isn't anything new. This, this isn't, like, the, the, the split apply combined thing isn't groundbreaking. I'm just trying to, like, label something. Uh, and in fact, this is a SQL query. It does exactly the same as that, that example where I did just one split from two slides ago. Uh, so. If you have a my data table that has a column of country and a column of revenue with a small r and a small c, uh, then this is how you would actually query for that data. Like, this is it. Um, notice that like in SQL, and I, again, once I started, like I never fully got SQL, and I, I think the thing that always tripped me up is that like you apply before you you group by, like the way you write the query out, like. It seems strange, like now I'm like, well, I, if I was designing SQL, I'd be like group by first, then select later, but I'm not designing SQL. Uh, this is how it looks. You can, like, if, if you're really comfortable with SQL, just try to translate every split apply combined that I'm presenting as a, as a SQL query. Now the cool thing is that, and really for this, like I encourage you to go and like read Hadley's paper. The introduction just basically says, look, this thing is everywhere. Uh, Excel pivot tables do the same operation, like, logically. Hadoop, it's called MapReduce. I mean, you can actually call split apply combine MapReduce. The only difference between, like, MapReduce and split apply combine is that MapReduce focuses on, like, mapping out and reducing on, like, many different machines. But then if you ever ran, uh, like, just if you ever tried running Hadoop and you, like, did the whole deployment locally on, like, a small data set, you're literally like split apply combining between different parts of local hosts on your machine. Um, and uh, that's powerful to, to realize that. And then uh, Druid is the database that we use at MetaMarkets that is open source. Uh, and again, same, same, thing combined, uh, th same thing applies. Druid doesn't have uh, a, a, a SQL interface right now, but it does have like, logically the equivalent interface. So to me, it no longer matters like, oh, like how do I translate it into this? It's like, how do I express this split apply combine idea as this query? Um, so uh, the thing, the thing that's, the, the, this is just how split apply combine works and the fact that it's everywhere and that's great. But then I, I went back to, to my visualizations and I'm like, whoa, this, this isn't arbitrary. Uh, I'm using split apply combine in these visualizations all the time. I'm just doing it implicitly. Uh, and sometimes not that implicitly because the D3 actually maps really nicely to, to split apply combine. Uh, the idea is that here we have like a really simple uh, bar chart of uh, country by, by some revenue. 
And notice, notice what I'm doing here. Like I'm, I'm doing a split combine. Like, so I'm, going, I'm doing a split combine on like the, the, the countries. And then I'm like, taking the top four. Uh, and top of what in a second I'll, I'll, I'll say. But, uh, and I'm mapping them onto the vertical axis. I'm using an ordinal scale, right? Some things are relevant to split apply combine, some, some not relevant, like don't really tell the database about the ordinal scale. Let's keep that a secret. Um, and I use country as a label. I mean, that's a design choice right here. I, I, I add the labels. I actually even, I, I say what the size of this visualization is going to be. And you know, that's, uh, that's important for rendering. The database, again, doesn't care. But uh, on the other side, how do I, where do I get the value for the, for the bars? Uh, well, I sum revenue for each of the splits, and then I map it as a rectangle where the width is encoding the revenue according to like some scale, a linear scale in this case, and I give it a color. Again, like a mixed bag of things that a database would care about and a, and a database wouldn't care about. But the concept here is that, whoa, within, within all of this information I provided, there is information for how to uh, query this data. And that's kind of like the big insight. Now, uh, like, you know, like this goes beyond just plotting a single, a simple bar chart. Uh, if we look here for uh, this like really simple grouped bar chart, uh, that's is actually one of the D3 examples. The way to, the, what, what, is, what is happening logically with the data that's being, being shown on this, on this slide? Well, you see that uh, the first thing we do is we group by state. And then we take only the top six states by population. Again, so if, if this was just like a flat file, uh, which is, for this example, it's like a flat file. You can just, you load it into the browser and you parse it with JavaScript and you do the transformation like on the fly, which still means you have to write the transformation. But it's easy because it's just all the data is already there and you're just doing a small transform. If you actually had to query this from a database, you had to, well, you'd have to make more than one query. You'd have to first find out the top states. For each state, you then have to do subsequent queries. And how do you even like write them? What if your database changes? Um, anyhow, uh, here, first of all, I split by, by state and I limit this to six, just the top six states. Within each state, uh, I, the, there's a split by uh, the age, which is a continuous dimension, binned to five-year buckets. And then I sort on the age so that like it's, like youngest to oldest people uh, going from left to right. Again, I apply some population to each individual bin, and then I map that onto my bar bars. And also, like an important thing to, to understand here is that all of these bar charts are actually using a common scale. So uh, that's, that's very important. I mean, you could render this on a not common scale. It's just like six bar charts next to each other, but the, the insights will be different that you gain from this visualization. Not necessarily, um, not necessarily less or more meaningful, but just different. Um, and this is how, uh, again, this is how this sort of split apply combine idea permeates like a visualization like this. And then if you get more complex than that, well, it's still, fits within this framework, although you might have to have a, a cool layout function, which, oh, by the way, D3 provides, which is great. Um, so let's say you wanted a time series, or let's say you wanted like three time series graphs on like one graph. What does that actually mean? Well, here in this example, it's just uh, Austin, New York, and San Francisco, the three lines. So here you split on city in your data. Imagine you're querying the data set. For each of those splits, you, you then split on time, and you probably, like, you probably bucket time to something, like to hourly or, or daily, uh, depending on, on the scale of your data you're querying. And then for each of those, you actually aggregate it, and then that is the data that you need to render this, this visualization. And if you've done D3, you know that even if I just gave you a flat file of data, you'd have to like, transform it to get into that shape. 
similarly, like the map might look like a really cool, impressive visualization. But in terms of data, it's like either really simple or really complex, depending on like what capabilities and what your data format is, because essentially you're just splitting here on county and then plotting it with a layout that happens to be aware of what counties are. That's just, that's just like a visualization, a visualization part. And we all know that the visualization part is easy, right? The, the query here should be easy uh, if your database doesn't support like geographical based queries, might be a little harder. Uh, maybe like you mapped it at ET, like uh, at uh, the time when you put the data into the database, you mapped what county this is or what zip code. But uh, if your data is in the correct format and your database supports geo queries, then the query is easy. Other than you have to figure out what the syntax for geo queries is uh, for your given uh, for your given database. So. What's the concept here? Uh, I started thinking about this. I saw, well, I have the, there are similarities between data querying and data visualization. That's great. Well, then why do I need to write anything other than just one thing? Like, why do I need to write two things? Uh, and and this, is where it came, this is where the facet idea was born. Uh, the idea, uh, facet is just uh, kind of a toolkit I'm, I'm using to uh, play around with this concept. But the idea is that you define a visualization once using split, apply, combine, and extras. You know, split, apply, combine, and, and, and friends. Uh, friends being specifically things that are specific to just data visualization, like plot, color, layout, uh, all of these kind of operations that the data, database simply doesn't care about. When you define your visualization like that, the split, apply, combine part of your definition, just the, like if you filter out all, all of the noise as far as the database is concerned. Well, that's enough as uh, Hadley's paper would argue and uh, I would argue and demonstrate to uh, make a database query or series of queries to answer that split apply combine. So essentially you can, you can map, you can take a split apply combine thing and you map it onto like the data using going to the database, figuring it out, transforming the data, crunching the numbers. Um, and that's, that's really, uh, that can be pretty powerful, I would argue. Sorry, Google, come on Google. All right, well, uh, in a second, my presentation will load. Okay, so the basic idea behind, behind Facet is, is very simple. Uh, that's a language that, is encode, that encodes split apply combined principles and on top of that builds uh, enough richness to express visualizations. And then there's a set of drivers. And uh, I, I don't know if drivers is the right word, but I really like the word driver, so I decided to use it. Uh, but it's basically something that takes a split apply combined query and then maps it to whatever number of database queries you need to leverage that query out of the database. And the driver can play dirty. The driver can be like, like oh, on Druid, this particular query would be the, most, the fastest way to do it, even though like, like, I only know that because I, I talked to the guy who sits next to me who designed it, but I use it instead of using uh, like whatever query like you should use. And then, uh, the, the driver might make more than one call for like a double split, like split, split. Uh, you would need to make a first call, then make a series of splits with a filter applied from the, from the first call to actually correctly answer that data. And, and in fact, again, you can cheat by doing like two group buys, but um, on the scales of data that, that I, I work with that simply like won't do because you, the data will be noticeably completely off. Um, and then the driver returns just a nested JSON result, transformed exactly in the right way that the visualization needs uh, to power the visualization. So uh, what does this actually mean? Like uh, for Facet, I just wrote three, three drivers to just try and experiment and see how, how well it works. Uh, one driver is just a JavaScript driver, something that takes a blob of JSON and runs it uh, crunches the numbers and spits out, spits out the correct, f 
correctly nested data, and then you can put it in, and then with that data and the description of the visualization, like all the color stuff, you can combine that and make a visualization baby. Um, and that's, that, that works. Essentially, in this case, uh, th this JavaScript driver is like a JavaScript implementation of Plyr. Uh, and also, it's uh, essentially like, or, or alternatively, a JavaScript implementation of d3.nest, which is like the transformation function that d3 gives you to transform this. And it, it's very simple, uh, very pleasantly simple. Now, there's a SQL driver. So uh, you guys are probably familiar with SQL databases and you know, run stuff in SQL databases. And, and this is great because you can just run this visualization in, inside of, like, you know, serve it from a SQL if you maybe are just exploring how, like, how to do it. And finally, like, and personally, more import, most importantly to me, there's a Druid driver that actually can access the, the Druid database that we run and you know, get all of this data out, to, even if it's just to render a small visualization like this. Uh, now, I'm a front-end developer, so uh, all of these drivers are written in JavaScript, uh, which is nice in a sense, because they can run either on like Node or on, uh, on the client, so you can imagine the client as being just this little aware, aware thing that knows how to issue SQL queries to SQL databases the, in, from the browser, or you can put that into Node and then have Node actually like run and do this computation and then just give you back the really condensed result. Um, each, each one has advantages and disadvantages and it's nice to have the flexibility to choose. Um, as, as an aside, uh, like, the, the reason I even started exploring Facet is because I deal with huge amounts of data, and uh, Facet is like built to work with Druid. Uh, and check out the Druid presentation tomorrow at Grand, Great America Ballroom J, J for just cut the bullshit and show me the data. Um, so now, now a demo, just to, to demonstrate what I'm actually like, kind of talking about. Uh, I have my, oh, wait, no. Just escape here. I have my like little node uh, thing running some of the drivers in the background. I'm VPNed in. Uh, yeah, you can't see it. That's cool. Uh, I'm VPNed into uh, to where the Druid lives, uh, and I also have just so you get a uh, th th uh, thing. I have my own local database. Now my password is root. It's very secure. Uh, and, and you can just you can see that it has just some data in it, and uh, also have some data in JSON files. So, uh, and by the way, this data is already cleaned. All of this presentation has been talking about like working with clean data, uh, data wrangling, and getting data to like a clean state from from w however you got it is a whole another question, uh, and. I'm, I'm not addressing it here, and I'm so, so glad that uh, 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 the Chang had this talk before me because it really uh, maps into this. And thankfully, there's a whole team of people, uh, some of them are in this room, who are dedicated to making sure that the data I work with is nice and clean. Uh, all right, so let's see. Uh, again, I'm not, so, so uh, just to start off, and let me just pull my trusty JavaScript console up here. Um, I'm not super interested in the visualizations right now, uh, but more in demonstrating how like this concept works. Um, oh, not, not this. So this is a very simple visualization. It's running the simple driver, which is just a JavaScript driver in Node, and it's doing it on a like this diamonds data set, which comes with ggplot2, uh, which is basically just a number all sorts of cool facts about diamonds. Um, and here we see uh, it's like a spline visualization, which is uh, like for different cuts of diamonds, how many of them are in my data set. Very simple. Uh, and if we actually look at the source code for this, uh, the way this, like, there is not much work to actually implement this. This is, this is great. All I did, I here, I have my helper of how this, fun how this like, looks like. All I did was I defined the driver here. The driver is there, use the diamonds data. And then I wrote this single visualization description right here. 
And it basically says, uh, like, if you see here, some of, the, some of the things are split, apply, combine. Some of them are layout, plot, stage. So if you take this, if you look, if you just take split by cut, apply count, uh, and then apply also average price, and then combine uh, sort, this is it. This is what you need to query this data. And if we see here, uh, the, this, this, this is talking to a driver that's running in this node process in localhost. Um, and the request here is a, uh, uh, a, a, a query uh, for, for that data. Uh, just a, J, a JSON object that basically says split, apply, combine uh, over and over again. And the response is like, well, in this case, it's not nested because it's just one level, but a nice object to drive this visualization that fa the f front end can interpret. Now, uh, if we look at, this is the view source. Uh, so this is exactly the same visualization in SQL. Uh, this is querying the SQL, my SQL instance I have running on my machine. Again, uh, if, uh, not this. Uh, oh, and here, the, the driver is in the client. So actually, if I run this, I can see in the network that my, I still need to query it through my node just to avoid cross domain querying restrictions. But I see that this is actually like what SQL spits at me. Uh, and the query here is a select cut as cut count blah, blah, blah. This was automatically generated from the split apply combined description. Uh, and the, the cool thing is that this didn't take more time to build, actually. This, th this example literally took no time because I just copy-pasted it over here. And you can diff them. You can diff these two files. The only difference is the driver definition. Here I say, hey, give me a SQL driver, connect to this table. In the other one, give me a simple driver, use this data. This, is, this, is, like, this code is character for character the same between them. Let's look at something else. Um, what is this? Uh, diamond average price by cut. So again, you can, you can use layouts. You can use scales. They're part of the, the visualization metadata. It doesn't matter how you map those things onto the screen, whether you use what's called uh, spines, where you just like size the rectangles vertically, or you use scales. You can use more advanced layouts to make really any visualization. You can plug in a force-directed layout if, if you're visualizing something where that would be appropriate. Um, Let's refresh this. So, and the important thing is you can nest this. Like I have uh, recursive in the subtitle of this visualization and the code is implemented recursively. But I think a better word would be just nested, although it's way less cool. I just realized that like uh, two days ago. Uh, it's too late to change the title down. But here, I, it's average price by cut by clarity. So this is, uh, this is running a SQL driver in the client. And again, here you can see if I refresh this with the network tab open, you'll see all of the, you see like not a single sing, SQL query, but several. The first one being select count as total uh, diamond count from diamonds. And then afterwards, for each of those, clar uh, for each of those, uh, sorry, it's this query that I meant. Uh, this one is the group by clarity. And then for each of the clarities, we, then select again by diamonds. And here we have the shared scale, uh, which is an import, a really important piece of this puzzle. Uh, and this, just, this, is, this is a fairly complex visual. Like, in terms of query time, uh, this is getting pretty complex. And if you uh, look at how this is done, again, SQL driver definition. This is actually, this is copy pasted from the previous example I showed with the SQL driver definition. And then a whole bunch of um, so I, I apply a total, total diamond count. I'm not using that. I was just demonstrating to somebody. I forgot this line in. Oopsie. Uh, but then I do split, apply, combine, uh, layout, blah, 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 plot, stage, on stage. Oh, and again, split for the second bar chart and build up the visualization like that. Uh, and I think this is pretty powerful. This, is, this would have taken me, like this visualization from scratch would have taken me probably about as much time to implement as actually implementing the whole like framework behind this just because it's just so hard to wrap your head around like how many queries you have to make if you if you don't have like a framework to think in 
Uh, now, finally, uh, just another example. Uh, this is uh, Wikipedia by edits by page by, uh, sorry, Wikipedia edits by page by language. So for every language, uh, what are the, for, for the top four languages by edits, what are the top uh, four Wikipedia articles for those, for those edits and like how do they look? This is, this is actually querying a huge amount of data. Like I don't, uh, again, my, my, I don't have good labels. Uh, I don't have like a thing that tells you over which time range this is going over. But this is probably querying like a month or two months of data in Druid. Uh, and making several nested calls to Jura to get all of this data out. And then uh, this, is, this is actually loading. It's just SQL and it's slow. I put one day of Wikipedia edit. All, uh, so we have this cool data set, which is just all of the edits on Wikipedia. I put one day of that into my SQL in, on, locally on my machine. Oh, it's chugging along in the background. Let's, let's watch it work some more. Uh, let's see if I can get my uh, my CPU fan to spin up right here. But you see, like there, it made one request. Now it's doing the second layer. Now it's doing the third layer. Oh yeah, look at all these requests coming. That's beautiful, right? Well, that that worked. Uh, so th this is this is in SQL, and then that's just for uh, for shits and giggles. Uh, refresh this one. Let me just do this network. This is uh, let me just refresh it again. This is actually the same exact data, just one day of Wikipedia data querying across Druid, uh, much faster, obviously. Uh, and the, so I guess the, the, the funny thing is that Druid is here being spoken to through VPN over Strata Wi-Fi uh, to like Virginia or wherever EC2 lives. And uh, here I have a MySQL instance running locally and it's barely, uh, like it's like, Five times slower, but um, not that not that like beating my SQL is a benchmark, but it's just funny. Uh, and you can see that the visualizations for these two again, oh, translated to English. Uh, the visualizations for these two are exactly the same, and I think that's a very powerful concept. So this is this is the 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 idea behind uh, what. Uh, what I'm trying to present, that we should unite these two concepts. And uh, uh, I would, if you are interested to learn more about this, uh, please stop by my office hours, which are today at 2.20. And if you're excited to learn more about Druid, definitely check out the Druid lecture when that starts loading. Uh, thank you. Pause. <laughs>